This is the counting circuit. It's a synchronous counter that counts the clock signal, which in this case is the square wave. As the signal oscillates between a logic 1 and 0, it produces the decimal count values on the display. This forms the basis of sequential circuits, which are combinational circuits that include memory elements such as flip-flops. Upon the activation of the momentary PVNO, the circuit counts from 0 to 9. The smart circuit involves two displays and several other components. It counts from 0 to 9.9 .9, with the inclusion of the decimal point. I also have two switches. This switch controls the direction of counting. When connected to V+, the circuit counts up, and when it's wired to ground, it counts down. This switch freezes the count. When activated, the count stops. This is the button input. The button input has two configurations, pull up and pull down resistors. And a pull up resistor, as indicated in the name, has a resistor above the button. This is called low side switching because the input relies on the pull up resistor. When the PBNO is impressed, the output is high since V plus is providing current. However, when the PBNO is pressed, the output is low since there is a path to ground. The pull down resistor shown on the right side has the opposite configuration. When the PBNO isn't pressed, the output is low since V plus isn't connected. When it is pressed, the output is high. This is called high side switching as it relies on the pull down resistor for an input. In the next stage, a pull up resistor is used with an AND gate. When the PBNO is impressed, pins 12 and 13 receive a high, outputting a low, and therefore turning on the LED. When the button is pressed, pins 12 and 13 receive a low, outputting a high. The LED turns off. This is the NAND gate oscillator. Here is a schematic of this circuit. The LED flashes due to an oscillation of highs and lows. This sub-circuit is essential to produce the clock input, which is the square wave. Here is the button input with a pull-up resistor configuration. When the PBNO is impressed, a high is received here and here, outputting a low. The input to this NAND gate is low, which means the other input is low. This outputs a high, making the inputs to the next NAND gate low. Two lows are sent to the last NAND gate, outputting a high. Thus, the LED doesn't turn on. When the operator pushes the PBNO, two lows become the inputs of the first NAND gate, outputting a high. This charges C1. This is the first RC1 pair which controls the duration of the clock input. The inputs to this NAND gate become high, outputting a low. Two lows become the inputs of this NAND gate, outputting a high. The inputs to the last NAND gate are high, outputting a low, which turns the LED on because of a path to ground. As you can see, the LED is flashing. It alternates between the previously mentioned high and low states, activated by the PBNO. The LED is visual confirmation of the square wave. Additionally, there are two RC1 pairs. RC1 controls the duration, while RC2 controls the frequency. Here is an animation of the capacitor draining and charging. As the voltage threshold drops less than half of the source, the output is low. As the capacitor charges due to an increased voltage level, the output is high. This constant charging and discharging creates the oscillation. This is the square wave generated by this oscillator. The rising slash leading edge occurs when the wave increases from 0 volts to V plus, and the falling slash trailing edge happens when V plus drops to 0 volts. This is the decade counter. This chip takes the clock input and counts the clock pulses generated by the NAND gate oscillator. This counter has 10 outputs, Q0 to Q9. Pin 15 is the reset pin. It should be low for normal operation. When high, the count restarts to zero. Pin 14 is the clock input pin. The output from the oscillator is wired here. Pin 13 is the disable pin. Like the reset pin, it should also be low. When it's high, counting is disabled and the count remains constant. Pin 12 is the divided by 10 output. The output is 1 tenth of the clock frequency. It's high for the first five counts, 0 to 4, and low for the last five, 5 to 9. This output can be used to drive the count of the tens of another counter. Here is a graphic showing the waveforms of each output as it counts the clock pulses from 0 to 9 before cycling. As the period of each clock input ends, which is the positive and negative interval, the next number becomes high. 
For example, when output 0 reaches its falling edge, it triggers the count for the next number. This is the decimal counting binary up slash down counter. The CMOS 4510 slash 4516, similar to the 417 decade counter, accepts the input as a clock signal and counts the pulses. The difference between them is how the clock pulses are counted. The 4510 slash 4516 counts in 4 bit BCD format. The 4510 counts from 0 to 9, while the 4516 counts from 0 to 15. The pins highlighted in blue are connected to ground. The pins colored in gray are irrelevant as they are only useful when the preset pin is high. Pin 15 receives the clock input and pin 10 controls the direction of counting. When connected to V+, it counts up and it counts down when wired to ground. The pins highlighted in pink are the outputs QA to QD and they count in BCD format. This format is a process of converting the numbers into their binary form. Each bit is in powers of two. QA represents 2 to the 0, QB is 2 to the 1, QC is 2 to the 2, and QD is 2 cubed. These binary outputs can be presented by four LEDs. For example, to show 9, QD and QA must be high as it shows an addition of 2 cubed plus 2 to the power 0, which is 9. The 4511 is a BCD to 7 segment display decoder driver. It converts the BCD values produced from the 4510 into decimal numbers that are compatible with the 7 segment display. Pins 1, 2, 6, and 7 are wired to the respective output pins. Pin 3, the display test pin, and 4, the blank input pin, are active low, so they must be high for normal use. When the display test is low, all the segments light up. When the blank input is low, all segments are off. These pins are intended to test if the 7 segment display work. Pin 5 is the store input pin, which should also be low. When high, the display number remains constant despite changes made to the inputs. The outputs A to G correspond to specific segments on the display. These outputs become high based on the BCD values presented. Now that the BCD numbers have been decoded into their equivalent decimal values, they must be represented on the 7 segment display. These pins have the same labels as the ones on the 4511, which make wiring straightforward. Pins 3 and 8 are the common pins. Either pin must be connected to ground. Both pins don't have to be wired to ground as they're internally connected. Pin 5 is the decimal point, which is useful when there are more than one display. There are two types of 7 segment displays, common cathode and common anode. Like the name suggests, the common cathode has all the cathodes of the LEDs connected to ground, while the common anode has all the anodes of the LEDs wired to V+. Each segment requires its own current limiting resistor because without it, the segment will likely blow, rendering the device useless. This graphic shows all the segments that light up for each decimal number. Here is the final polished version of the counting circuit. The breadboard prototype has been transferred to its PCB form with a case. There are two SPDT slide switches. This one turns the circuit on and off, and this one controls the direction of counting. This is the entire counting circuit in Falstad. It counts from 0 to 9 with the addition of the 6 hexadecimal letters A to F. In conclusion, the counting circuit is a great introduction to sequential circuits and has several time-sensitive applications which allow it to be useful for a variety of purposes.